It means um, that in some ways I have achieved everything that maybe a young dancer consciously or unconsciously dreams of. And it means that I'm now have, I now have a sort of responsibility. I've got to do, bad, do good work. I've got to do the best work I can. And I have to be less afraid of the future. Well, in this business, the um, popular notion is that you're only as good as your last performance. And in my case, you're only as good as your last award. But uh, everything is up for grabs. And you have to uh, prove again and again, I have to prove to myself that um, I can do this. I can do this. I envy visual artists. You know, visual artists have many friends who are visual artists. And, there's a record that they can uh, point to, they can take you to, you can look at what they were doing 10, 15, 20 years ago. Having just now attempted, we are attempting to bring back early duets of uh, myself and Arnie Zane, works that uh, were very, very important to us and I think to other people in the field. I was in the studio maybe two months ago and I was looking at two young dancers do it and I realized I had never seen the piece other than in a grainy black and white video. And what's more, no one had ever seen the piece since 1979. That is um, very, very strange, very strange. Now everything can be captured, uh, but that is um, not the truth of what we do. Not the truth. It's got to be done again with real people in real time and space. When I set out to make this piece with my collaborators, um, we were thinking, where is Lincoln? And we said Lincoln should be in the single mom. Lincoln should be in the young student just graduating from college at Dartmouth or Yale or NYU. Or Lincoln should be in the discourse. And in our piece, we have the sound that you hear constantly of a locomotive. And I have said um, that that locomotive is the sound of uh, the democratic process. We are on the train. We have no idea if it has a destination, but it is moving. So Washington is that project as well, this, the, our government. And everything is on fire, always maybe, but particularly now. And when we started doing this work, I said that we know something about a civil war that we have not acknowledged. We are still embroiled in a civil war. Maybe not that one. The only thing about our civil war is that there are so many fronts. We don't have a north and a south. We are fractious, and the war is everywhere. Maybe it's guerrilla warfare, but there is a civil war. And this is the front line right here in Washington. A good man exclamation, a good man, question mark. That was what we thought the piece was going to be. It was going to be prosecutorial. I was not going to be soft-minded. We were going to be tough-minded, and we were going to take this guy to task and, and put him in the great uh, court of public opinion over in the historical context. But I realized, one, I'm not historian enough to do that. And I really don't have an appetite for it. The art that I make has got to be something that translates ideas, notions, into feelings. And then they become ideas again. So uh, the good man idea of let's ask the question, is Lincoln worth his, his uh, adulation, is not the point. I know that I found that I loved him as I did the work. And by loving him, I understood I loved a set of questions that I've grown up with, and maybe a certain pain that I've grown up with, because that's what he represents. When I watch my dancers on stage at the end of Fondly, and I see that look when the lights have gone down and then the audience is applauding, the lights come up, they are so vulnerable. They are, and I think, oh my God, they're there because I have willed them there. And I have given them this to do in this, this glaring light of public scrutiny. And there, it breaks my heart. And then I feel fierce and proud 
um, I feel like my mom, my mother, Estella, who could, uh, on a dime, connect with her God. And it was a God that was a God that was in tears, but a God that had a lot of anger and a lot of belligerence, you know? And I'll be damned if anyone is gonna take away my right to be here. And I feel that for them at that moment. Whatever the audience thinks, treat them with respect, you know? They have done something. They have done something that is a kind of a sacrifice. Now with that comes a humility that people don't have to love what you do, and that you have to maybe go further than the audience does. After all, they've been sitting in the dark all night. You've been out there. But the reward is that maybe you touch them in areas of their heart or their mind that hmm, few of us are even aware exist, maybe, if the work does that. So that's how I feel about this, um, this, this point in my life as a performing artist and having a company and making it work like fondly. Most of the people I danced with were my colleagues. They were my age. And we were all on this adventure together. And then there comes a time when you realize that um, many of the people you're with could be your children. And if you're lucky enough, I suppose, like immerse, they become your grandchildren. And that gets very strange. Now, that's a wonderful thing. You've got to be able to be in command of your ego and your, uh, so as to make room, because you can no longer, I was a jumper in my day. You can't, can't compete with the 22, 23, 24 year old jumpers. But you've got to be able, when you're still performing, to be able to do more with less. And that's a, a wonderful thing. And then you, even that has to move out of the way. And in my case, I say that art making is participating in the world of ideas. So then it isn't so much about my body and whatever that particular uh, give and take with an audience, then it becomes about what are the ideas that become feelings, that become ideas on the stage. How does a pedagogy work? My associate director, Janet Wong, is a brilliant um, woman who has studied classical ballet and is a, and a brilliant student of contemporary dance. And she, has, she is the teacher. She bridges, theoretically, my ideas about movement, many of them rooted in my body and my experience, and the young bodies that come to us. That is a wonderful thing to witness. I used to feel competitive with her because I thought that the director must be in there sweating with everybody, because that was what we as dancers share, that effort every day, the sore muscles, the, the victory of discovery, gravity. But then there comes a time when the ideas are like dropping, they come into a class, for instance, and they're all doing a combination. And they have respect for me. So if I, I can suddenly take a class from exercise and then ask a question about their intention in performing it that shifts what they are thinking about themselves and about what they are doing. That is called, I think, that is what an older artist can do for and with younger artists. And I have to understand that they are still people. They're not me. They're not my children. They are my colleagues. And in my more highfalutin moments, I say that they are uh, sublime materials. Personalities, flesh, bone, spirit, minds, all the stuff that the work is made out of. And I'm humbled by that. If I were talking about what am I looking for in a dancer, I say a dancer has to uh, come with some rudimentary ability. I am interested in people who can do more than I can do. And um, they are also, they have an, uh, an intuition about what could be. In an audition, the dancer that I choose might not be the one that has the greatest mastery of the steps. But that dancer, I can't stop looking at them. Or I feel that dancer is eating something voraciously. They're tasting it. And then they are playing it back in a way that lets me know, oh, I never thought of that emphasis or that pause or that. And then I think that this person is going to add to this process, which is all about exploration. And our studio is a bit like the classic uh, 
dojo in a way, or maybe a Zen environment, where we try to encourage fresh mind. And fresh mind implies that everybody in that room can lead. We are in the habit of asking the youngest person to the oldest person there, what do you think? We need something here. Can you offer something? Now that's true. Collaborators, I like, would like to have um, the collaborators express an affinity for what we're doing. I really, I've worked in the commercial world and I know what for hire means. Everybody has to make a living. But um, that's not going to cut it when it gets down to the wire because I need inspiration. This is an inspiration sucking machine. That's what it does. And you've got to be generous and you've got to be quick because I am a royal son of a bitch. I'm a nice guy enough, but I want what I want now. And sometimes I am not political. Sometimes I'm not sweet. And sometimes it is about what, by any means necessary, I am going to crack you to get you to give me something because this moment is a sacred moment. Now I'm getting full of myself, but that's the real deal. That's what, it, that's what it's about. Can the collaborator put up with that? And can we offer them enough money? It's difficult. This is not their baby. They have not been doing this for 30 plus years. And if they're not here, they can be somewhere else. So there's a, there's a, there's a balance. Something is being exchanged, but then there's something transformative that's supposed to be happening. Can that person deliver it? Well, the questions are there waiting for me, lurking. They're lurking in the deep recesses of the nighttime. Sometimes it looks like obsession. It looks like fear. And then sometimes it's the, the kind of uh, casual glancing thought that if you have the, if one, if I have the presence of mind to stop and turn and look at that seemingly insignificant idea about space or about time, or about personalities, if I dare look at it, um, it invites me to investigate. And when I investigate, oftentimes it's a dead end, but sometimes it opens a door and a whole world of possibilities are, are out there. Yes, the questions are lurking. Some questions are like my face. It's older, but it's my face. You know, um, who, who was saying that, that, that maybe it was someone speaking about Picasso and Gertrude Stein or uh, painting her and they were... Uh, I'm confusing two, two ideas, so I won't try to tell that story, but the idea that our, an artist is always, in some ways, drawing a portrait of themselves. It sounds pretty self-involved, doesn't it? Well, many artists are self-involved. Those questions, some problem, existential questions, spiritual questions, God knows I wish I was free of them. You know, there was a piece called Uncle Tom's Cabin that I did here in Washington back in the, um, oh, it's, it's a well-known piece, but, and every night the piece that had 60 people in it, community people, would, would stop and I would sit down at a table and speak to a man or woman of faith and ask them questions like, does sin exist? Is AIDS punishment from God? Um, what is, um, what, what is, is Christianity a slave religion? All these sort of things. And this man or woman of faith would give me these answers. It was part of the show, and we did it with 35 different people. My mother, Estella, was traveling with me, and in an airport somewhere, it was in Europe or whatever, she said to me, son, every night you're asking the same questions. When are you going to get the answer? <laughs> Sweet, it was sweet. Our mother did not understand what we call pure inquiry. Now that's the highfalutin way, pure inquiry. Then there's this other one which I call obsessive involvement. How do you engage those two and make something out of them? That's what all the work is about. You need a higher sense of purpose. Some people call it a spirituality. You need a sense of community. You need the ability to make realistic goals and be willing and able to change them, sometimes at a moment's notice. 
And you must cherish small things, incremental change, details. Many people say, oh, you've, you've worked in Broadway. You have, I have won two Tonys, right? But it's not clear yet if I am made of the stuff that can go the distance because I demand that both worlds I'm in change. They must change. The audiences must change in the dance world, audio, audio, uh, the avant-garde dance world, and, and this is a hard one, the commercial theater world. And that means producers have got to be more ambitious, more um, adventurous. And we got to, the marketing people, how do you talk about a work that people don't quite know how to look at? You've got to find new language. Both those fields, you have to find new language. That's because, and for my work, that's because of the questions that I'm asking. I think it's also happening across the board right now. So it's a very exciting time. It's a really scary time. We've got to pay our bills. And yet we have to answer to God, our God. Almost every work is a near-death experience because it threatens to be soul-crushing when it fails. We can survive. It's not being in Iraq or Afghanistan or on the streets of Libya or Bahrain or in the midst of a revolution, but it is, there's a juggernaut here in this world and you have this crushing feeling that it doesn't really matter. It's expensive, it's hard to make a living, time marches on, you age, the public is fickle, presenters are desperate and therefore they're fickle. So yes, maybe it's not such an overstatement to say that um, all artists, and the more successful you are, the more I say this, of it, you are kind of a survivor. And we're always looking at a near-death experience, knowing that nobody gets out of here alive. Nobody gets out of here alive. Does your work? Ah.